Welcome everybody to another episode of the Sunday School Dropouts podcast. I'm so glad to have you here today. Um, Andrew is not going to be with us today. He is on a little missions trip. Just kidding. He's on vacation. Um, and so it is just me today, but I promise we have a really, really wonderful episode in store for you. Today is the first episode in our series of religious trauma and politics. And so I'm excited uh, to be welcoming in um, a favorite of the Sunday School Dropouts, April Ajoy, who I will tell you about in just a moment because we have had a fabulous conversation with her and I'm so excited for you to listen. Um, but we have this series, I know we've talked about it in our previous episodes. Um, we have this series for the entire month of October and even the first week of November where we are talking religious trauma and politics, how they mix together, why it might feel like an extra triggering time of year, as well as we'll be finishing out this series on election day with uh, self-care plans, coping skills, ways to help you navigate through uh, that day, that week, uh, until we know what the results are, and of course, inauguration day and beyond. So I'm really excited about this series that we have for you. We have some amazing guests lined up, and um, I'm just so excited for you to hear the conversations. But before we get into the episode, I wanted to share with you a couple resources that we have for you, especially as we're ramping up into uh, the last you know month or so before the elections. If you're listening to this the day uh, that it drops, we are a little bit over a month away from the U.S. presidential elections. And so that means sometimes the crisis and the chaos is growing, as well as the stress and feelings of confusion, conversations with friends and family. So we wanted to make sure that we're doing our part in providing you with some resources if you want them. So I know we've been plugging this a little bit, but we are going to plug it extra hard. And that is the Religious Trauma and the Elections course that's being offered through the Center for Trauma Resolution and Recovery. I am leading that course as well as many other amazing guests. This is a self-led course. It actually started all the way back in February, but you can join now and you still have access to all of the material that's been released since then, as well as everything that we'll be releasing through the very end of this calendar year. We wanted to make this course uh, a source of support, so we're not going to be telling you who to vote for, how to vote, where to stand on positions, but this is things talking about like how do we cope with our own stress and anxiety? How do we develop senses of internalized safety and trusting ourselves? How do we establish boundaries? Having conversations with friends and family that may not agree with us. How to deal with religious trauma triggers during this election cycle. So the course is full of amazing information. And every month there is a module that is focused exclusively on exercises, skills, tools, and coping mechanisms that you can pick from and learn and hopefully implement into your own life. So that course is currently going on. You can go to traumaresolutionandrecovery.com, click the courses tab. It'll get you straight over to the course and you can use the code Sunday School Dropouts for $50 off. The other thing, I'm not going to tell you entirely what it is, However, uh, I want to just start to tease that we also have another thing coming up through the Center for Trauma Resolution and Recovery that as the election cycle is getting closer, that puts a lot of people just in need for extra support and places to process. And we are going to have that for you. Stay tuned next week. We'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about it and how you can get more information. But I just want to put that plug out there. We do have something in the works. It is coming and you will hear more about it next week. So like I said, we do have an amazing guest in April of Joy, and I will tell you more about her later, but I'm very excited to be talking to her today. She has a book coming out today called Star Spangled Jesus. If you haven't read it or ordered it, I would very much encourage you to do so now. You can do that wherever you buy books. April's going to be with us shortly to be talking to us about her own journey in Christian nationalism, her journey out of it, what Christian nationalism is and um, how it can be harmful to people, how it is maybe very different than uh, what the teachings of Jesus actually are. And so I'm really, really excited for you to hear our interview with April today. Um, and 
Like we've said in all of our other episodes, we know that sometimes the things that we talk about in this episode or any of these episodes might bring up feelings, emotions, and triggers and might require more processing um, or perhaps are too much to handle. So please always feel free to skip any episode or parts of episodes and come back if and when you are ready. Our goal here is to help you trust your own body and lived experience so that you can take what you need and leave what you don't. So before we get into our interview with April, I think it's time that we have a flannel graph story time. It is time for our flannel graph story time, which is the part of our episode where we talk about some of the things that we've been reading or listening to or learning. And I'm excited today to share with you a little bit about a topic that I've been reading about mostly over this past summer. Now, um, I actually do a lot of reading and have done a lot of reading about this over many, many years. But this summer in particular, uh, there was just things going on in my own life, in my clients' lives, and things that were happening even in the greater culture at large that caused me to want to read and learn more about various personality disorders, most specifically borderline and narcissistic personality disorders. For me, I very much think about how these things can be helpful when coming out of a high control religion because it really helps us to understand uh, what happens to us um, as well as some of the behaviors that people demonstrate and example um, that we are maybe still surrounded by. And even moreover, I think there's just so much research that talks about how unresolved trauma can show up as personality disorders, most specifically borderline personality uh, disorder, but sometimes even narcissistic personalities as well. And so what I mean by that is for those of you who don't know that uh, oftentimes when we have trauma that's unresolved, it can um, shift the way that we interact with other people. It can shift our personality even. It can shift the way that we engage in relationships and how we attach to people and how we communicate with people and what we expect of people. And interestingly, there is a lot of research that talks about how um, unresolved trauma, especially complex trauma, can really show up and look like borderline personality disorder. And that doesn't necessarily mean you have borderline personality disorder. It can, but it doesn't necessarily mean that. And one of the things I find as I have worked with many clients is that oftentimes when we work to resolve the trauma, some of those characteristics seem to resolve themselves on their own uh, with minimal or sometimes even no effort. Now, of course, unresolved trauma over time can really become our personality and it really can take on a personality disorder or disordered personality in the sense that this is just how we view life and relationships and ourselves. And so I I don't I've really appreciated knowing this um, because it helps us sometimes understand other people better as well as ourselves better. And one of the things that I always tell people is that the point of knowing this isn't necessarily to like label every single person with a personality disorder, but instead to just kind of educate yourself as well as recognizing that in so many cases, when people demonstrate these behaviors, it actually has nothing to do with you. It's about where they're at in their own life. So that's like my little preamble to saying there's two books that I read this summer that seem to be of uh, particular help to me and just really, really great information. And I'll make sure to put these in the show notes as well. And the first book is called It's Not You by Dr. Romani Dervasula. I hope I'm saying that right. Um, but the book is really about being in relationships with narcissists. It, I, I found it to be extremely helpful for people who are coming out of high control religions as the dynamics of power and control, including narcissism, are the same, whether it's an institution or a group or a person that you're experiencing it from. And the book kind of goes over various kinds of narcissistic personality types, how to recognize the narcissistic behavior, and then gives a lot of practical tools um, on setting boundaries and how to reframe communication, how to in- interact and engage with people who uh, maybe are, are narcissistic or are, are um, demonstrating characteristics like that. 
And then the other book that I read and wanted to share with you is called Stop Walking on Eggshells by Paul Mason and Randy Krieger. And this book has been out for a long, long time. I've actually owned it for, I think, probably 15 years or so. So there's a couple different additions to it. Um, but really, but I reread it this past summer and um, one of the things that I found to be so helpful is that it fleshes out the different characteristics and symptoms of borderline and narcissistic personality disordered folks and helps um, us to understand how this impacts relationships in like very specific ways, as well as more general ways, meaning like how you might person personally be impacted, as well as kind of like overarching themes that pop up in relationships and communication and, and other areas. They also give a ton of practical tools, tips and ways to communicate in order to move uh, towards self-protection, as well as healthier relationships, including um, relationships with people that might demonstrate these types of characteristics. So it was, uh, you know, not exactly light reading. However, it was very informational. And I highly recommend um, both of these books. If you're curious in knowing more, if you're wondering uh, to know more about yourself, if you found that you're maybe kind of taking on certain personality characteristics and traits, um, or mostly probably if you are in relationships with people that are demonstrating traits and characteristics like this, it can be a really, really helpful tool. So that's my flannel graph story time for you today. I hope you've enjoyed. We are absolutely thrilled today to have back on our show, April a joy. And this is the third time that April's been on our podcast, but the first time without her partner Beecher. And as much as we love Beecher, we are so glad to have April here today as she's going to be talking to us about her book that is coming out today called Star Spangled Jesus, which is available wherever you buy books and is also on Audible. The links for the book will be in the show notes today, so make sure that you click those. For those of you who uh, haven't listened to the episodes that April has already been on, I highly encourage you to go ahead and listen to them. And and also to follow along with her because April is a content creator who uses humor to shine light on the harmful, toxic, and sometimes just weird traits of American Christianity. She is the co-host of the Non-Binary Marriage Podcast and also the co-host of Evangelicalish, as well as a co-host of a weekly episode on the New Evangelicals Podcast feed, focusing on what's been happening in the culture and its connection to religion that week. April is passionate about helping others overcome indoctrination and recognizes on a personal level just how difficult that can be. She knows that if she can do it, anyone can. You can find April across all social media platforms at April Joy, And as of today, you can buy her book anywhere. So without further ado, here is April Joy. Well, hello, April. It is so good to have you back for the third time on Sunday School Dropouts. You are now tied with one other person for the most appearances. So we're glad to have you here. Wow, are you going to give out like a trophy when we hit oh, yeah. like five times? Yeah. Well, isn't, don't they have that for Saturday Night Live where you get yeah, like the, the jacket? Coat? Yeah. <laughs> well, we'll definitely have some jackets, like Sunday Perfect. School drop ups. <laughs> I'll give it to you when we go to the Creation Museum. <laughs> oh, oh gosh. Yes. <laughs> we have to plan that, but you know. In, I know. I need a couple years to recover from the arc yeah. before I can yeah. go to the Creation Museum. <laughs> it's like maybe like 2027 20, or so. Yeah, that, feel, that feels right. That feels Yeah, better. I think so too. <laughs> and then maybe by that point, they'll be starting on uh, the Tower of Babel, which mm. I think Beecher said they were going to be doing. I know. So. Yeah, that's in, I think it's in the works. So yeah. <laughs> Wow. Things to look so, forward to. So many places to go over the next decade. <laughs> so it's <laughs> good. Oh, anyways, well, I'm so excited to have you here today to be talking about your book, Star Spangled Jesus, that is um, coming out. No, actually, as we're recording this, it is the day that it drops. That's when it will come out, this yeah. podcast. So out uh, now. It's out now, everybody. Go get it if you haven't already. We've been promoting it on the podcast already, so make sure you go and get it today. For those people who haven't already ordered it and or haven't followed your story and whatnot, I wonder if you can just kind of share 
briefly or however much you want to your own experiences inside of Christian nationalism, what you believed, the practices you engaged in, what motivated you to do what you did? Yeah. Well, I was I was born into an evangelist <laughs> family. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so my dad was a a world evangelist. So I grew up homeschooled. We traveled around the world and um and all over America. Like we would mm. travel in our R V and my dad would preach at different churches and I would sing beforehand. Um and we were more just like a typical ministry, um, you know, just trying to save souls. Like that was the ultimate yes. goal. Crazy. Um, <laughs> yeah. And my grandfather, my dad's dad, was a pastor of a large church in Dallas, Texas, which is where I was born and raised. And in like the 90s, it had like 4,000 members, which was pretty big for back then. Yeah. yeah. And so both my dad and my grandfather were on uh, local radio and Christian TV. And so I kind of grew up in that world. Sometimes I'd sing on these shows too. Um, And so I guess like my Christian nationalist highlights, because it's so funny. I still get comments when I talk about this of people being like, you were never, you were never a conservative. You were never a Christian nationalist. You're just like saying all this for clout. So let me, I'll give you my (laughs) receipts real quick so that when I start talking about Christian nationalism, whoever's listening, you know, Mm-hmm. I, I know what I'm talking about. Um, yeah. I was, um, one, I believed that uh, America was a Christian nation, was founded as a Christian nation, and that mm-hmm. should stay mm-hmm. that way. Mm-hmm. And that basically we could probably blame whatever tragedies that we had on the fact that we had allowed sin into our country and had yes. strayed from the righteous path, AKA elected Democrats. Um, <laughs> when I was in high school, I made a MySpace page called I'm a Christian, therefore I'm a Republican. Um, I, I went to two different <laughs> yeah. George Bush, George W. Bush rallies um, wow. in full support. I couldn't vote yet because I wasn't old enough. Um, but I did, you know, my sacred Christian calling as soon as I turned 18 and I voted for John McCain was my my first presidential first election. Okay. Yep, and then okay. um, so about, I guess about a year or so before that, a few years before that, um, my dad had written a book called "America Say Jesus," and basically in the book, it, the goal is to get as many Christians to start saying Jesus publicly, including an open letter to at the time. George W. Bush to define our God instead of saying, you know, God bless America, we should say Jesus bless America because there's power in the name of Jesus. And if we are being vague and politically correct by just saying God, that can mean anything because there's other gods out there. But if we, Mm. we need to define it and, and, um, you know, actually say the name of Jesus and then God would protect us again. But if we didn't, that we would experience bloodshed yeah. um, on our Gosh. in our country. Um, and so like the book kind of goes through the founding fathers and like different things that they've said, uh, uh, you know, uh, about them being Christians and promoting Jesus and all that stuff. And, you know, left out are all the quotes about wanting to separate church and state. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I didn't think about that at the time. So yeah. anyway... We went on like a three month, two or three month motorhome caravan where my we had put America Say Jesus like decals all over the bus, and so we oh, drove gosh. it from South Florida to California, went through Vegas, went up and down the Las Vegas Strip several times, honking and like yelling out, "Jesus loves you, <laughs> America Say Jesus." Um, and then I wrote a song called "America Say Jesus." Um, ah. And like it, it screams Christian nationalism. The lyrics, <laughs> the lyrics are so bad. I mean, it lives in my head rent free because I mean I wrote it. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I, I've yeah. I've released like little clips from the song on social media. I'm hesitant to release the whole thing at once because I'm afraid there's people out there that will like it unironically. <laughs> Right, right. So, yeah. <laughs> I yeah, mean, but- I definitely want to like as soon as I heard that in the book, I was like, "Oh, I'm I am going to need to hear this." I know. Sure. I I might I might still we'll see. Um, mm-hmm. maybe mm-hmm. I'll just do it like little by little, and then if someone really wants to piece it all together, you know, they can. Um, but I sang that song on the Jim Baker show when I was Ooh. eighteen. Okay, um, I love it. So yeah, and then later on as adult, I went to um. 
Christian colleges for my undergrad. I went to Pat Robertson's university in Virginia for my Mm. uh, graduate degree in journalism because I wanted to be like Sarah Palin and go into politics through a journalism degree. Um, And I wanted to be on Fox News. I was like the ultimate goal. (laughs) But I ended up being a producer for CBN, uh, which is 700 Club, which is Mm -hmm. Pat Robertson. So that's like adult career Christian nationalism. Um, Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So that's my it's street intense. cred. <laughs> <laughs> I love it because, well, as I was reading the book, um, I, I found myself laughing a lot, partially because I know your voice and like how you say things. And so mm. I could hear you saying things in the book. And I was like, that's really funny. <laughs> um, like just how you might say things. But then I was also so many times I was like, oh my gosh, like, I didn't even know I was really a Christian nationalist, except I was, you know, like yeah. just so many of the practices, the beliefs, like the motivation underneath it. Um, like, and I don't even, yeah, I, I was, it was just like, even what you were saying there when you were like, um, you know, don't say God bless America, Jesus bless America. Like we, I grew up at a fundamentalist Christian camp and like the slogan was clearing a way to the cross And my dad was like, we have to change this and like Mm. rallied with the board. It's clearing the way to Mm. the cross because there's only one right way, right? Like it's that proclamation piece of like words matter so much and it has to be in this specific way so that people know like we have the right way. Follow us. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, totally. It reminds me of, um, do you remember that song by Avalon back in the day, Testify to Love? It's like, for as long as I shall live. Oh, um, hell yes. Yeah. And like one of the <laughs> words is like, I'll be a witness in the silences when words are not enough. I remember like railing against that line because like, no, we shouldn't be silent as Christians. <laughs> like that, like Avalon had gone, you know, I mean, we didn't say woke back then, but yeah, if it was today, yeah. we would have said that's a woke line. That's so funny. Yeah, I was probably <laughs> relish in that line because I never quite could understand like why do we need to preach so much like why do we need to go Mm. overseas why do we need to go to different states like shouldn't what is that is it the Saint Francis of Assisi quote like uh you know spread the gospel or you know live the gospel or whatever and if if necessary use words I was like yeah that's what I really like because I don't want to get get into you you were ahead of the game I would have been like no that's that's (laughs) dumb (laughs) but I probably would have been a little envious of you like wow she's so like in it you know Mm. she's not afraid um I wasn't afraid in my own ways but I don't know I mean I I would have sung on the Jim Baker show too if I had the chance so Uh, yeah (laughs) I mean Jim Baker was a little before my time like all of his scandal so Mm. I didn't fully understand yeah who he was (laughs) um (laughs) but yeah anyway that was it yeah. That was a treat. So yeah, exactly. yeah, and I think I think that's kind of the what the point of that I really want to get across in mm-hmm. the book and in my story is that Christian nationalism, most of it is really covert and it kind of yeah. hides underneath the surface of American Christianity, especially like American white American evangelicalism. Mm-hmm. And it's just it can be written really hard to separate the two because they're so intertwined. And and that, that's a lot of reason too. Like when I started deconstructing, mm-hmm. my faith and my political beliefs were so interconnected that mm-hmm. I pretty much was deconstruct, like I had to deconstruct both like simultaneously because I realized, yeah. oh, I am voting these way or like this way mm-hmm. because of my faith. And I have mm-hmm. my faith because of these political beliefs. And they were like, they were just so interconnected. And, that, and that's not mm-hmm. to say, like, I think we all vote or we all mm-hmm. support different policies based on our worldview. Sure. But mm-hmm. it had become so unhealthy that I, I, in my quest to, like, take America back for Jesus, mm-hmm. I had become, like, a really terrible Christ follower. Yeah, that's so interesting. Because I agree with you. I think there's a way to have your faith. And have your faith inform your political beliefs, but they don't have to be so intersected that they are overcoupled that they literally are the same thing. Um, right. And it's, it's, a, it's just a very black and white ideology mm-hmm. where I believed that only true Christians would vote Republican. 
Yeah. And, you know, and vice versa. And that like, basically you weren't, you weren't really a true Christian unless mm-hmm. you under like, you might've been a baby Christian and you were struggling, but we like had yeah. pity on you. Like, oh, bless your heart. You don't know like that God yeah. needs us to fight his culture war by voting for these people and by pushing these policies and by legislating mm-hmm. morality. Yeah. Um, yeah, it, yeah. 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 So I know I'm skipping ahead a little bit, but one of the questions that we're asking a lot of people in our religious trauma and politics series is how do you define Christian nationalism? Like when you talk about it in your book and in your story, what is it? Yeah. I think there's, I think there's a small level definition and a large level definition. And I always am careful to say like, Christian nationalism is not really a monolith. There's Mm -hmm. a lot of different types of people within the movement. There's people that are overtly Christian nationalists. They wear the label proudly. And then there are people that perpetuate um, nationalism in some way with their faith who would say they're not, that they're just being good Christians. And that's where I fell. Um, Mm -hmm. I would say at a very basic level, Christian nationalism is a conflation of a political ideology and someone's religious beliefs. And then at a large level, it is a desire to enact policies and laws that reflect your specific worldview mm-hmm. to the detriment of other worldviews. Like it's yeah. it's a very exclusive ideology. So how that looks today is you have you have you literally have people that are wanting to well, we've seen it with they overturned Roe v. Wade, you see it with abortion mm-hmm. bans, and that's saying, you know, we believe this is murder, even though there's a whole group of people that would define it differently. And so because we believe that you can't do this, you know, that's legislating morality. Same thing with the ban, like a lot of books that are being banned or with putting the 10 commandments in the classroom or with all these anti LGBTQ laws, these laws are based on a very narrow view interpretation of the Bible. And because they believe that that is, absolute truth, even though there are even other Christians that would interpret the Bible in a different way. And then there there are Jews that would interpret the Hebrew Bible in a different way. Mm. But it's it's saying like, no, y'all all have it wrong. And we are going to make policy and laws based on this because this is absolute truth. And there's also, there's just a very, um, it's a little bit narcissistic because it it doesn't take into account other ideologies, other beliefs. Um, it's very much, you know, you need to uh, conform to our way of life because we have, we have absolute truth. We and mm-hmm. we are abs- like, they believe that, and I believed this too, that only good comes from God, specifically yeah. the Christian God, and that mm-hmm. anyone who does not have like Jesus in their heart, basically, they cannot be good. And, and and there's like this emphasis over belief versus action where you could have mm-hmm. someone like Trump, for instance, mm-hmm. who is terrible, like not a good person. I think mm-hmm. most people could agree he's just, he's done some things that go against what you would call a righteous person mm-hmm. according to, you know, biblical yeah. morality. Um, but because he espouses the quote unquote right beliefs or at mm-hmm. least is putting the like basically putting those policies that are on the right side into play, they can forgive a slew of offenses mm-hmm. and and defend him and champion him. Whereas you can have someone like Barack Obama who on the on paper is has is a great family man, has been married, has great kids, seems like a really good moral character, but because his beliefs go against are on the, you know, are on the opposite side. And it's not even beliefs mm-hmm. that just yeah. his political policies, policies. Yeah. you know, yeah. he got branded the antichrist. He got branded a Marxist or a Muslim mm-hmm. or, you know, like all these things that in their minds are just like the worst thing ever. And it had nothing mm-hmm. to do with action and, and how he actually lived their lives it has everything to do with whether or not they line up ide- mm-hmm. ideologically correct. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm putting another layer on this, but like, and this is only because I I think maybe because of the age gap that we have, which isn't huge, but it's big enough where Mm -hmm. it's like, I, I have like memories of being an adult prior to like, um, I mean, gosh, what was the first election I voted in? George W. the first time. Mm. Um, and so I was in high school during the Clinton era and the Monica Lewinsky scandal. Oh, yeah. Scandal, you know, like all these things. So like I have a lot of memories of of 
knowing all the rhetoric, but not it wasn't what it was what it is today. Like yeah. and have being able to see the transformation. Like I remember learning from my parents that that America was built on religious freedom. And then sometime it changed, you know, like in yeah. my middle school years into Christian freedom. America yeah. was built for Christian freedom. Um, and it's, it's just like so interesting to see that. Um, and so the, the other layer I'm adding onto that is because like there was a time where like, I, I mean, I obviously voted Republican because that's what I was supposed to do. That's the pro-life right. candidate. Like that's, you know, everything. Um, but it wasn't as connected as it is today. And I wonder, you know, what your thoughts are with the introduction of like Barack Obama, a black man, and the turn into what we might call even white Christian nationalism. Like how yeah. does the white add on to it? Yeah, so... I mean, it can go, it goes really all the way back to civil rights. Of course. Era. Yeah. I mean, it really, and even further back, it can go back yeah, to the yeah. Civil War, it can go back yeah. to the beginning. <laughs> um, but in modern times, I actually think it probably, like the modern Christian nationalist, um, or like just the modern conflation of politics and white Christianity or white evangelicalism, I think you could go back to 9 11. There was this huge. Um, Islamophobia that took over um, America, but it, like even yes. in a lot of churches. Um, and I know when you know when Barack Obama came on the scene, there were lots of conspiracies that he was actually Muslim or that he was born in Kenya. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I think that stirred a lot of fear in a lot of white conservative Christians because and, and it's fear based on misinformation a lot of it and, and conspiracies i don't know did you ever watch that movie it came out i think it came out in 2012 before romney and obama election um it was by dinesh d'souza called obama 2016 it was basically like what the world would be like if obama won a second term and it was like socialism america's destroyed and they had talked about like o obama's like former pastor and his ties to terrorism. Like it was straight mm -hmm. propaganda, mm -hmm. but it like fired me up. I was convinced yeah. that if Obama won a second term, wow. that um, like America would cease to exist. And you, like, yeah. And like, I, w I literally made a campaign video for Romney and I was talking about, you know, how I, like there's not going to be jobs for us anymore. Like I was in grad school. Like I, I was complaining about a job I didn't even have yet. You know, like yeah. it, <laughs> oh, the, the, the white privilege is it's so cringy. But um, I, so I think I think it, it, it was kind of rooted in this like Islamophobia. And how do you counter, you know, uh, a foreign religion? with our religion. And so I think that's when you see this, like it's, it's, I think it was kind of similar to the cold war when, you know, as a way to fight communism, like, you know, like godless communists were like, we are Christians, like Christians fight communism almost in a way, maybe it was like that, like, well, we've got to put Christian law into our, you know, constitution and into, um, into our country to fight off, you know, the elusive Sharia law that, mm -hmm. you know, that Fox News was saying was headed to America. Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. That makes sense. And it's also, I'm, I'm just like processing in real time. It's not lost on me too that, you know, Roe v. Wade, which is, you know, or in, you know, being anti-abortion is so foundational to Christian nationalism. And that the, everything with abortion stemmed from racism, like because they couldn't get their like racist policies through that they couldn't have segregation or s segregation inside schools. You know, they were losing funding and whatever. So they switched to this, you know, oh, abortion, that's going to be our issue that we're really going to ride hard on. Yeah. And but it it's not like they just lost all the racist stuff, right? Like it was still there. It was just so much more covert. And as you're talking about 9-11, I'm like, I wonder if that was like the entryway, you know, 22, 24 years later to say like, oh, now we can make it more like overtly racist. Um, yeah. You know, like it didn't work back in what was it, 1980, when Reagan was voted into office over Jimmy Carter. But now it will work because we've had this direct attack that we can point to of like, 
I, I don't know. I could be way off, but that's just something, you know, as you're talking, like there's a connection. There has to be a connection. There. Yeah, I think I think there is. And I think, too, with the way I think people were feeling a, a lot of a lot of white evangelicals have this like anger deep down and, and this fear of losing yeah. our way of life, even though that our way of life like, what does that even mean? Like, you know, like we're not, yes. it's actually not in danger at all. Mm -hmm. But when you, when you have all this fear mongering, if, if when you're consuming just, you know, conservative Christian talk radio or, you know, TBN, CBN, Daystar, Fox mm -hmm. news, when, when that's all you're consuming and it's just, and it's, I mean, I'm sure you heard this too. We're like, Christians are persecuted. Christians are persecuted. Like yes. we believe that we are being persecuted in America, even mm -hmm. though we really weren't. Um, yeah. But yeah. when you when you believe that and you're being told mm -hmm. like no they're coming to take away your guns because they want to take away your right to worship, mm -hmm. um, it, it's almost like y it builds anger over time mm -hmm. when you feel it's an us versus them. Mm -hmm. So you're when you're already conditioned to believe that there is an actual enemy out there and they're coming for you, mm -hmm. then when you see someone like Trump come along and mm -hmm. actually say these things out loud that you were mm -hmm. thinking this whole time, mm -hmm. you almost feel like, oh, finally, finally, we can just say it. Finally, we can just be openly yeah. bigoted or racist. Mm -hmm. Like he said, it's okay. He be, he was elected. And so I think mm -hmm. Trump gave permission for a lot of white evangelicals and Christian nationalists to start saying the quiet parts out loud mm -hmm. that were always there. Mm -hmm. But like, even like you brought up Clinton yeah. when he, I remember I was a kid at the time, but I remember distinctly like my dad being like, talking about how Democrats were the immoral party because mm -hmm. they didn't want to impeach Clinton and mm -hmm. that, you know, if, if Clinton would, would lie to his wife, he would yeah. lie to the American people. And that, you know, that righteousness and morality was just, was important. Like, you know, I, I heard yeah. all that, like yeah. Franklin Graham, like, I feel like all these big, not, big name evangelical leaders all were condemning Bill Clinton and saying like, mm -hmm. yeah, we would do this no matter who it was. And then mm -hmm. to see them all just like Franklin Graham saying the prayer at the RNC this summer mm -hmm. and saying that he believes Trump is an honest man. Like I, what, what world, what yeah. world are we, are we living in? Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I, I mean, I remember those conversations around the dinner table as well. Character matters, right? Yeah. That was like the big, the big thing. I remember that bringing that exact example to family members before the 2016 election. And I was like, I don't understand why it mattered then. And it doesn't matter now. Like, please help right. me understand this. Um, yeah, it's wild. I mean, do you think that that's what the appeal to Christian nationalism is in terms of like, saying the quiet part out loud or feeling like my rights are about to be taken away? Or what do you feel like is that appeal for people? Yeah, I, d I definitely think there's a lot of fear. There's there's a fear of losing a more traditional way of life. You know, even, even Trump's slogan, make America great again. Again, yeah. When was mm -hmm. it great for anyone not white? especially yeah. like n a white male, like when was mm -hmm. it great? I think mm -hmm. like that alone is mm -hmm. very telling in that, yeah. you know, they have this idea of how things used to be, get back to the good old days. Mm -hmm. um, but the good old days were seeped in white supremacy. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So I, I think, I think there's a lot of fear in that. Um, and I think to, people don't realize another gr a, a really great book is the color of compromise by Jamar Tisby that really like mm -hmm. goes into the yeah. his history mm -hmm. of white supremacy in the white e American evangelical church. Mm -hmm. And I think if you read that, you just realize how much of Christian nationalism and just American evangelicalism in general mm -hmm. is rooted in racism and yeah. white supremacy. And I think a lot of the issues that we see stemming from that, come from like really, really, really deep roots um, yeah. in, in bigotry. Yeah. And because they're so deep, they can be hard to see. Mm -hmm. And when you're surrounding yourself in, um, you know, just an echo chamber pretty much, like we, when you grow up in it or if you're going to church, mm -hmm. all the media you consume, 
um, is Christian. Like it's even preached from the pulpit. Like Mm -hmm. they, they use that verse, you know, um, to, to think on good things. And so to not listen to secular music or to not listen to, you know, the mainstream media, which has liberal bias. And so you are being conditioned to basically create your own echo chamber Mm -hmm. and you're taught that the quote unquote secular world is led by Satan and so anything that comes from that world is automatically suspicious. And that's mm-hmm. like, and I think too, it's so easy for people to write off like, well, that's fake news. Even if mm-hmm. you have actual stats or evidence, it's like, no, mm-hmm. that's fake news because that goes against my worldview. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It is interesting because I, um, we have, we have a guest coming on in a couple weeks who, um, her, her name is Angela Dinker and she's about to come out with her second book, but her first book is called Red State Red State Christians. She's done a lot of research around, you know, people in different parts of the country, whether it's rural, suburban, you know, city, north, south, east, west, you know, all of that. And I, I resonate with her work because I grew up in rural Minnesota, mm. and I now live in a southern city. Um, so I feel like I have this unique experience that a lot of people don't necessarily have of like the north, but also being rural and the south, but in a city, you know, like, yeah. And it is so interesting. When I when I've read her stuff to hear people in rural areas in non coastal areas in non big cities, and the way that they have felt unheard and um, like they don't matter and like people don't really understand like the type of life that they live. And it feels like Christian nationalism somehow like reaches out to them and yeah. says, come on, you're one of us. We will protect you, um, you know, and you're, you're, yeah, like you're already kind of this like red blooded American, real American, you know, whatever. And you love God, probably you got a church on Sundays, like it feels like this perfect mixture. And it feels like, yeah, whether it's fear or fear of losing what I have, like there's like, it's like it's been primed, yeah. you know, over the last several decades for somebody or some bodies or groups of people to come in and say, if you don't feel heard, listen to us, we're gonna empower you for whatever our end goal is. Yeah. There's a lot of camaraderie in, in these spaces, because when you believe that someone's coming after you, you know, Mm -hmm. they say they are after you. Like, I don't know if you've seen that meme of Donald Trump where it's like, they're not after me. They're after you. I'm just in the way. But like, that's just, that's a genuine belief that a lot of people have that the big bad they or leftists mm-hmm. or socialists or Marxists or whatever, they're coming after good Christians because they're godless, they're Satan. And especially when you, for Christian nationalists um, and, and just evangelicals that believe in spiritual warfare and believe mm-hmm. that um, the rapture is going to happen at any moment and like the, the end times are going to, that we're in the end times, that the Antichrist is soon to rise up. There's this, it makes you feel a sense of purpose that your life is bigger than you, like that, that you're part of this resistance of, um, you know, this elite group of people who are controlled by Satan Mm -hmm. and that you are one of the few people that know this truth. Everyone else is being duped. Mm-hmm. And when when that's your mindset and and you have and you're surrounded by people who believe the very same things, it can be really mm-hmm. hard to one break out of. Mm-hmm. But two, it it is it it it's inspiring. It makes you it, yeah. you know, it's hard to tell someone like I mean, talk about an existential crisis when you believe that for your whole life and then suddenly you realize, "Oh no, not everybody is out to get me." Mm-hmm. And there's a reason why you know, scientists and educators and professors and doctors and experts and researchers and all these people go against a lot of your beliefs. It's not Mm -hmm. because they're out to get you. Mm -hmm. It's because maybe your beliefs are a little bigoted and and Mm -hmm. harmful. And, but that's also a really hard thing to reckon and mm-hmm. reconcile with when you have believed this whole time too that you're a good person and that you're standing mm-hmm. up for good. So yeah. there's like a lot of cognitive dissonance of we're the good people standing for righteousness. And, you know, I'm like one thing that my dad taught a lot with like the end times was that 
basically before the Antichrist could take over, like all the Christians had to be like would be gone. Like we would mm-hmm. have to be gone in some way, whether yeah. that was the rapture or like mm-hmm. just persecution, um, mm-hmm. because we wouldn't we wouldn't stand for the Antichrist. And so yeah. when you so like literally every election, the whoever the Democrat was was. Mm-hmm. All like even Biden, I saw it with Biden that he was the Antichrist, and you know, yeah. I've seen people now say that Kamala Harris might be the Antichrist, and mm-hmm. it's like, uh, it's just it, it's the same old story. Just they just keep changing the face, and the person's never the Antichrist. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And dare we say that there may be other people that are being hailed as heroes that. <laughs> You know, oh my gosh, that uh, are actually better an, and fit and the Antichrist. Anti- yes, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and yeah, exactly. Because when you think of like Antichrist, it's not, yeah, it's like they're anti Christ. Well, what did Christ stand for? And that means they're against it, right? And you, yeah, when you look at different political candidates and policies, you're like, gosh, the, and, and then I hold that up to the Bible if that's your source of truth. Like, it seems very clear, you know, yeah. where different policies line up, but you know, that's, you know, can't be convinced otherwise, you know, I get that. Yeah. I get that. Yeah. So where do you see, you know, Christian nationalism being like harmful, meaning like to an individual, like how does it harm people individually and also collectively? Sure. So individually, and I can just, I'll just speak on my own experience. Um, it forces you by default, to have a very black and white ideology or belief system. There's not a lot of nuance. nuance. It's very dogmatic. Um, And it can be really hard to have genuine relationships with Mm -hmm. people who don't also believe the exact same things. But then once you do get into those relationships and you get into a community, you realize pretty well maybe you don't realize pretty quickly cuz you're in it but once you leave you realize that that community was really based on conformity and not a genuine relationship because mm-hmm. as soon as you step outside any one of those belief systems um you're demonized or yeah. or you're no longer in the in group mm-hmm. like it's those communities are very much conditioned on you believing the same things and again like mm-hmm. doing actions they could forgive a, a, a whole bunch of terrible things people do as long as the beliefs stay mm-hmm. intact. Um, but it, also just on your psyche, mm-hmm. um, it's just, it's not, I don't think it's healthy to to just believe that there are whole groups of people in the world that have demons yeah. that mm-hmm. are evil. You know, if you're trying to follow the teachings of Jesus, like love your neighbor, Mm-hmm. Is is a, is a huge piece of of being mm-hmm. a Christian, um, yeah. and it's really really hard to actually love your neighbor in a Christian nationalist ideology, yeah. Um, because you just it, it's love with an ulterior motive. It's love right. based right. on you changing. It's it's mm-hmm. love, but you are actually an abomination, and I need you to mm-hmm. stop basically being who you are in order mm-hmm. for me to be in relationship with you. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's also just very fear based like on a on just a, a psychological level if you believe that satan could be around any corner or any yeah. worldwide event mm-hmm. is is you know going to trigger the rapture or trigger the end times and you know like i i literally have seen people in in rapture groups on facebook genuinely so upset mm-hmm. over the idea that their dogs are going to be left behind for when mm-hmm. they're when they're sucked up in the rapture and like they they have so much anxiety over it that they like they've they've written notes they they always have like a week's worth of food um i mean it's just it's just a scary mindset to live mm-hmm. in when you believe like oh the end of the world's coming at, at any moment and you can either be part of it or help mm-hmm. stop it mm-hmm. um and then on a large scale it's harmful because it doesn't take into account any it's 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 one singular belief system mm-hmm. trying to call the shots for everybody and it's not even just christianity like we say mm-hmm. christian nationalism but it's not all of christianity like there's there's over 45,000 christian denominations worldwide mm-hmm. it's it's one it's american evangelicalism is a very 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 small Mm-hmm. percentage of what takes up makes up all of the Christian right. religion. But they believe they're the ones that got it right. Mm-hmm. And so their idea 
of a Christian nation is very patriarchal. So it harms women. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, there's, there are, there are Christian nationalists currently calling for um, the, to repeal the 19th amendment, which is the woman's right to vote and wanting to ban contraceptives, wanting to make it illegal for no fault divorce. Mm -hmm. So you're Mm -hmm. talking about women that have been in abusive marriages now being trapped, Mm -hmm. um, it's very patriarchal. And then, you know, people that just believe it's a woman's yeah. role to just stay home and not have any leadership position mm-hmm. whatsoever. That, you know, a woman's role is only to raise babies and mm-hmm. support a man. Mm-hmm. So you have that side. And then just the, the anti-LGBTQ oh, narrative, yeah. so hateful towards gay people. Um, you know, I... There's there's a couple books out there that are pro Christian nationalists and that they've they've um, talked about the idea of making you know homosexuality illegal and like a crime uh, that oh gosh yeah. that you can actually like could be punished mm-hmm. um, you know there's 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 some preacher I can't remember his name um, in Texas um, what's the name of that church I don't remember but he's literally called for like the for the death of of gay people. Wow. Um, and like, yeah, I, I would say these people are on the fringes of Christian nationalism and these were people that are, that would be more, um, obvious and open about it. Yeah. But they still like, there's no one like the white evangelicals are not calling that out. Like these people feel comfortable in evangelical spaces. Mm -hmm. Um, and so the, and, you know, and not and not just to mention, if you have any belief that's not white Christian evangelicals, like I, they've even talked about, um, I think it was Stephen Wolf who wrote the case for Christian nationalism. But I, th- I think he tweeted mm-hmm. at one point that progressive Christians would be considered heretics, and that in a in this ideal Christian nation that they want, heretics um, could could be punished by the law. Mm-hmm. Um, that it would be against the law to not be their version of Christianity. And like, so the, the Christian nation that a lot of these Christian nationalists want is oppressive to even Christians. Like the only people that Mm. would benefit at all, which I, I mean, benefits a strong word, but it basically is just, just white Christian men would be in power and, Mm -hmm. and that's it. Yeah, and it's straight it's a, white Christian men. Right. And they're they're yeah. like commanders from the handmaid's tale type of Christian yeah. men. Like not yeah. good Christian men. Mm-hmm. Um and so I and I don't think I don't think we're we're close to that mm-hmm. at this point. But mm-hmm. with Project 2025 and if Trump were to get elected again, yeah, it's not out of the realm of possibilities. And that is the scary thing. And so you want to stop so, yeah. it and you want mm-hmm. people to realize, oh, is my faith actually influenced by nationalism and take a step Mm. back and realize, okay, maybe what I'm, you know, pushing for and calling for and voting for is actually harming people. And, you know, I like, Mm. I just, I just want people to know like Christian nationalism Mm. is a perversion of both, um, the Christian faith. And it's also a a perversion of the constitution. It it goes Mm -hmm. against the whole like separation of church and state and just the, the freedom that our founding fathers claimed that our country was for. So Mm -hmm. Christian nationalism is not freedom. It's, it's a theocracy. Yeah. Yeah. You bring up such a good point about, um, you know, the 45,000 denominations and evangelicalism is one and maybe even tiny. And yet their voice, their ability to sway and influence feels very disproportionate, perhaps to the number of people, I guess, that might like identify themselves as, as such. And I'm curious to know your thoughts as to why that is. Um, yeah, I, I really don't, I don't know why that is because I, yeah. it's like, we just, we're the main characters in our own mind. Right. Um, yeah. And I do think there's a lot of American exceptionalism involved, mm-hmm. you know, where you believe that God blessed America, like, uh, like mm-hmm. literally, and that God helped us win wars, yeah. literally. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, like I, I think people, a lot of evangelicals believe that America is like kind of God's favorite country, like maybe tied yeah. with Israel. Um, sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, but I I think one of it, I think it's a defense mechanism. Okay. Because you are your be- the, the beliefs are not popular with mm-hmm. like most people. Mm-hmm. Um 
And I think people are aware of that to a degree because, which is why they claim the persecution, right? But in order to justify the the harm that were caused, because, you know, I, I was aware people had told me about, you know, high suicide rates and LGBTQ kids because, you know, if, if they were in a Christian home or if they, you know, if they weren't affirmed, um, you know, and you're able to write that off as like, oh, well, that's just demons doing that. That's not because I'm not loving them or, you know, Mm -hmm. but if you were to reconcile the fact like, oh no, that's because they feel oppressed and that God will never love them because of things that I've said, then you have to be like, you, 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 you have to justify it in your head of like, well, it's because what I believe is the truth Mm -hmm. and they, and you know, Mm -hmm. they would go to hell if, yeah. if I wasn't being honest with them. And wouldn't it be better for them to not have rights here on earth than to burn alive forever in hell? And so you you yeah. you justify these, you justify the harm, but you don't look at it as harm. You look at it, at it as like a means to a good end. Yeah, yeah. Which would be technically considered love in that person's Right, mind. it's tough love. Yeah. It's love, mm-hmm. love the sinner, hate the sin. And so like yeah. even like, even though you you could be looking at a gay person that you've just made cry because you told them you believe they're an abomination going to hell, and in your head you think you just loved them. Mm-hmm. Like that, that, that was love. And it's so messed up and twisted mm-hmm. and seems so obviously not love being on the outside. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But but people that are on the inside, they a lot of them, I mean, now I do think there are actually there there are some bad faith players involved sure. that yeah. genuinely like no, they're hateful. Yeah. But I do think your average going person mm-hmm. has been conditioned to know that that is mm-hmm. is a type of love. And if you believe that the Bible is literal, like a lot of more fundamentalist groups of evangelicalism mm-hmm. do, then you also believe that God who loves you unconditionally would send you to hell forever for just not believing the right thing. So you're also kind of mimicking who you believe God is mm-hmm. and which is not really loving yeah. either. So, but, but they can justify it. Cause like, well, look, God did all this. God killed all these people in the Hebrew Bible. Mm-hmm. So like, you know, the ends justify the means, but mm-hmm. you know, at, at the end of the day, it's like, at what point do we take into account how many people we're actually harming versus mm-hmm. following, you know, specific beliefs in a mm-hmm. book? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's just, it's so wild to think about. And, on, you know, in part because I have to think then about myself of like, mm. oh, yeah, I mean, I I totally believed that way. Absolutely yeah. believed that way. And and thought that it was the tough love. It was the, you know, I'm I'm trying to save you so that you don't have a eternity of hardship and burning and, you know, hell, essentially. Right. Oh, gosh, that's so much. Um so with, with that, you know, I heard a podcast, I was listening to a podcast a couple months ago now, and it's it's a podcast about cults, but not specifically about, you know, high control religion, though some of their guests are are that. But they've been in a cult, are out of it, it who's an, again, non-religious cult, and they were talking to somebody who had come out of a Christian nationalist background. And one of the hosts said something to the effect of like, is like, is this a big deal? Because I'm just like seeing it for the first time this election cycle. And and the person who was being interviewed was like, uh, yeah, because like they've been playing the yeah. long game for 70 years at this point. Um, but but it does stand to reason that there's a whole bunch of people who did not grow up this way that are kind of hearing it almost for the first time or really like overtly seeing it for the first time and are like, do we need to be worried about this? You know, like, is this something that is a thing? And all of us are like banging our pots and pans together going like, please listen. Um, So with that in mind, like, how do you think that Christian nationalism is influencing this election cycle? I mean, I think it's pretty obvious, but like for those people who are like, what is this? You know, how do you think it's influencing this election? I mean, the people behind um, Project 2025, which, you know, I know Trump has distanced himself from, but he, the, most of the people that wrote that plan were in Trump's administration. Like they, 
It was, it's a conservative plan and that the stuff in there is not surprising to anyone who grew up in that world. Like this is something that not even a little, yeah, yeah, that like the wanting to women to stay home, wanting to ban gay marriage, ban abortion. Like these were all like pipe dreams for us Mm -hmm. growing up. Like this was like the end goal of things that we wanted to see happen in in our country. And so, um, and, and think of like, the amount of white evangelicals that have pulled for Trump, um, that are are behind Trump, that have a lot of influence. You have Franklin Graham, who spoke at the RNC, which I already said. You've got people like Robert Jeffries, who's a, a pastor in yeah. um, Dallas. He has yearly worship, like Patriot worship Sundays called Freedom Sundays, where they just, mm. I mean, it looks like they worship America, but he's a big Trump supporter. Um Like you had, I think it was mainly white evangelicals that influenced Trump to move the Israeli embassy to Jerusalem, which caused all sorts of unrest. And and Mm -hmm. they wanted that move because of biblical prophecy. Right, right. um, Which, you know, that's a whole other story. Mm -hmm. Um, But Christian nationalism is playing a huge role in in this election because those, like, I mean, Mike Johnson, the Speaker Mm -hmm. of the House currently, he... I don't think he would admit he's a Christian nationalist, but he he very much is. I mean, he yeah, he had yeah. the appeal to heaven flag up. Um, there's also a group that's more charismatic Christians, which is like Paula White. Yes. Um, yes. Mm-hmm. Um, they're, they're like the new apostolic. Apo- new ap- apple. Uh, ap- <laughs> apostolic. Apostolic. <laughs> yeah. The new NAR, a new yes. apostolic reparation. Right. Yeah. That yeah. that movement is is mm-hmm. really big. Right. Um, I mean, they, they've been big for a long yeah. time in in this in this Christian nationalist world. Mm-hmm. But they believe in the Seven Mountain Mandate, um, right. which is basically Dominionism theology, mm-hmm. which is that the belief that before Jesus can come back in the rapture or you know to start the end times, mm-hmm. that Christians have to have dominion over the seven main mountains of influence in the world, which, hold on, let me, I'm going to Google it because I'm going to yeah. get it wrong. Um, but that's government, it's media, mm-hmm. um, it's education, family, yeah, education, yeah. hold on, I'm going to get them all right here. Um, business, arts, entertainment, media, government, family, education, and religion. And so basically yeah. Christians have to, they feel like they have a call from God Mm-hmm. to for Christians to control all of these seven spheres before Jesus can come back, which is why mm-hmm. you see such a huge push for yeah. Christians to take over the government mm-hmm. because they believe that's also like that's a godly call that they mm-hmm. believe they saw in a vision from God um, yeah. to to basically enforce a, a theocracy. Mm. Um, yeah. So it's I mean, Here's the thing. I do not believe for a second that Trump is a Christian nationalist. I don't think Trump is a Christian at all. I think Trump is in it for himself and mm-hmm. just he will go wherever whoever gives him the most power. And mm-hmm. right now the people giving him power are Christian nationalists. Mm-hmm. And if you think about it too, even he, like he's flip-flopped so much on Roe v. Wade and yeah. you know, he he actually started to be a little more pro-choice um mm-hmm. in the general and then who got upset? a lot of the yeah. more conservative Christian nationalists. And so he mm-hmm. he walked that back yes. um, because I do, yeah. like those are the people that are calling the shots in the Republican mm-hmm. party right now. It's very far right, extreme mm-hmm. Christian nationalism. Yeah. And I like people just need to be paying attention to it. It's something that we need mm-hmm. to be stopping at this level before yes. it gets to a point where we can't stop it anymore. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Maybe like turning towards a little bit of hope because this can all be doom and gloom because yeah. <laughs> you got out of it, <laughs> you yes. know. So it's like, so what? What was that process like for you? What was it that kind of, for lack of a better term, like woke you up to see or to ask questions or to cause you to pause? Yeah, I mean, there's a lots of little things that happened over like a ten year period. Um, the main thing was meeting people that I had been taught had demons, you know, like I met my first gay couple, um, in grad school and they were really kind and I didn't know how to reconcile that. Um, you know, or, or, you know, talking to a Muslim family when I worked at a gym and they were also very kind and I didn't know how to reconcile that. Um, eventually over time, you know, you keep getting these little chips into the armor, 
um, and eventually breaks it down. Um, I would say the biggest thing, though, that woke me up was reading the teachings of Jesus and then comparing that to what a lot of main evangelical leaders were saying, um, wow. you know, like by taking, you know, taking the, the country back for God or to fight for our rights mm-hmm. and especially like storming the Capitol, like all the Jesus flags that were there on January mm-hmm. 6th. Um, I just think like, I, I believe, I do think there's hope. And I think most people that are wrapped up in Christian nationalism, whether they realize it or not, I think most of them have good hearts and mm-hmm. they have been sucked up into this uh, into this world because of fear and because of a lot of misinformation and lies that they've been taught and that mm-hmm. they believe. Um, but I think at the end of the day, if we can go back to the teachings of Jesus mm-hmm. to say like, you know, Jesus turned himself over to be crucified. Mm. He did not tell his disciples to storm the capital of Rome for his release. Mm. You know, he told Peter when Peter did try to fight back to lay down his sword. And so I think there's there's a, a huge contrast between the teachings of Jesus and what Christian nationalism is is fighting for. Like they're they're wanting to take away rights from everybody else that doesn't believe like them, which is just so so like the opposite of mm. anything Jesus ever did. Yeah. Um, And the only time Jesus did get angry was against the religious leaders of his day. Yeah. Um, So the hope is, is that I do believe they, the way that people can change is if if I can change, anybody can change. And I think the best Mm -hmm. way to do that isn't to yell at them, you know, and to call them, you know, bigots or whatever, which they are, but um, you know, like pointing the finger isn't usually the best way to mm-hmm. to get through to people. The best way that I have felt is in like one-on-one conversations or in like small groups conversations and just asking them questions mm-hmm. that basically make them have to explain why they believe the things that they do. Like, yeah. you know, like why why does a trans person like bother you? Have you met a trans person? Like, do you understand mm-hmm. gender dysphoria at all? Like, what would you what would you suggest someone do if they feel mm-hmm. like they could not live another day in their body? Or mm-hmm. you know, like, what if your child came out mm-hmm. as gay, uh, like, and and you love them, and they were, you know, like yeah. like asking them just questions um, mm-hmm. that hopefully make them put themselves in someone else's shoes. Um, that that was what chipped away my armor over Mm -hmm. time. Um, and you know, and granted everybody's different. Everyone's approach is going to be different. And there's some people that are probably too Mm -hmm. far gone, you know, that are really going to dig in deep and double down. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, I, but there is, but there is hope (laughs) because I do think the more and more people start talking about Christian nationalism, um, you know, and I've had people reach out to me since I've started talking about this on, TikTok or whatever. And that were just like, oh my gosh, like I didn't realize how much of my faith Mm -hmm. was nationalist and I'm like re-examining it. And, you know, and I think most people fall in the middle. Most people are not on the extremes. Mm -hmm. Um, so, and, and at the end of the day, we do have the numbers on our side. Like the Mm -hmm. popular vote has never gone to the Christian nationalists. Like that doesn't mean they can't do some damage, Mm -hmm. but they don't have the majority for sure. Yeah. I love what you say about, you know, like the the one-on-one interactions, the people, it's the relationships. Like I can from my from my own self and my own story, like um I I was still very much like in a fundamentalist religion, but I was it was like my first job as an intern uh for therapy. And I I mean, I was working with convicted adult and juvenile sex offenders, so it's like mm really, really different than how I had been living my life. And on the one hand, obviously horrible things that they have done and not discrediting or discounting that. Um, But then listening to their stories, how Mm -hmm. did I get here? Um, Not as a justification for their abuse, but understanding them as a human, understanding the things that had happened to them. And then, of course, even after that job, just working with people and going like, oh, these like people don't fit into these boxes that I've created. Um, Maybe it's the box that's the problem instead of the person that's the problem. 
And I just feel like when you are in relationship with people, you can't not change. Like you are changed by relationships and by people's real stories. It's very hard. At least it was really difficult for me to like sit in front of a woman who's trying to pray the gay away and she's thinking I'm this horrible person. I'm like, or maybe you're perfect. Like maybe you're exactly who you were created to be Mm. and we need to re-examine the theology. Like I don't know how that doesn't change people. And I think the same is true with Christian nationalism. Like it's through the relationships and the conversations versus pointing, you're wrong, you're stupid, I can't believe. I mean, all that does is it puts defenses up and digging in harder. Um, Right. And I do think because that that personal experience and getting to know people who think differently to you is is so powerful yeah. is one reason why you see such a war against edu- like public education right yeah. now from Christian nationalists there's like this mm-hmm. huge movement of them telling their telling them like you need to homeschool your kids because if you go if they go to school you know they're going to be yeah. corrupted if they go to college mm-hmm. they're going to you know get indoctrinated by some mm-hmm. liberal agenda um mm-hmm. You know, when in, in reality, it's just realizing that the world is a lot bigger than the worldview yeah. you were born into. Yeah. And it, that can be scary or it can be really, really beautiful. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. I love that. Well, I am thrilled that you have a book coming out or out now um, talking about all of this. And it's diving even deeper into uh, so many of the things that we talked about today. So share with the listeners like about your book, where they can get it, all the fun stuff. Sure. My book is called Star Spangled Jesus, Leaving Christian Nationalism and Finding a True Faith. And it's basically... Uh, part memoir. I tell a lot of stories that are kind of funny. It's humorous, by the way. Mm-hmm. So it is It is kind of funny, as funny yeah. as we could make Christian nationalism be. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, so funny stories, but also uh, educational. Um, I go into like what Christian nationalism is, um, give some history. Um, and it's also part guidebook of mm-hmm. here's how I changed and hopefully mm-hmm. The Christian nationalist in your life, or if you're a Christian nationalist reading it, can yeah. change too. Yeah. <laughs> I love like on your quiz that you created, you're like, okay, if you're, you know, basically just stop here. You're probably not gonna like the rest of the book. Yeah. If you rank <laughs> Proud Boys level, yeah. just don't finish the book. I don't need to yeah. be on a hit list. So <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I love it. And that it's available wherever people can purchase books, correct? Yes. Correct. And on Audible, because I think you read it. I did. Yeah, I read the audio book. So that, that's available. And it's also um, available in Kindle ebook awesome. edition. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Highly encourage everybody to go get it. Like, uh, you know, like April said, it's, it is very funny. I found myself laughing out loud, like many times, in part because I, it was like I could hear you reading <laughs> it. Um, and I know how you sound. Um, but also just, yeah, it was just kind of funny. Like it was just funny. <laughs> Oh, well, that's um, very encouraging to hear. Yeah, yeah. But also, like, it was very informational. And and I'm going to say the word convicting, but not in a bad way. Because like I said, for me, it was like, oh, yeah, I was way more in this than I had even, like, imagined I was. But when you were talking about what motivates it, what are the tenants, you know, I was like, mm. oh, yeah, check, 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 like all of those. And so oh, yeah. even though I may not have been as outspoken, it was definitely living in me in that way. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, that's good. I, I hope more, more people can realize that about, you know, their Absolutely. Face. Yes. And where else can people find you uh, if they want to follow your stuff on social media? Because April does incredible TikToks and reels that you will laugh at and, you know, be convicted at also. <laughs> <I'm just kidding. laughs> well, yeah, thank yeah. you. Um, yeah, I'm at April A Joy, A J O Y. Um, on TikTok, Instagram, threads, Facebook, and Twitter, pretty much all the places. Oh, and YouTube now. Oh, nice. I keep forgetting to mention YouTube. <laughs> yeah. Look at you. I love it. Mm. I love it. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been such a great conversation, and I'm so excited for people to read your book and continue following your work uh, because I think they are in for a treat. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, and go, go buy the book. The first Yay. week is really important. Yes, so. pre-orders first week. Get yes, as a fellow author, get <laughs> get it in there. <laughs> I love it. All right. Well, thank you again, April. Thanks.
Thank you again so much to April Ajoy for joining us for this podcast. I absolutely love talking to her and I'm so glad that she was able to share with us so much about Christian nationalism, what it is, the motivations behind it, the way it harms people. And of course, um, I'm so, so excited for her book coming out and really highly encourage everybody to go and get it wherever you buy books. Do it this week because that the first pre-orders and first week of book sales are what really, really matters for authors. So make sure that you go ahead and order that this week. Um, but more than anything, I just hope that people can take away from this episode more of what Christian nationalism is. And I know it can sometimes be hard because Christian nationalism is so closely affiliated with one specific political party. And the goal here isn't to necessarily promote one political party over the other, but instead to show what is happening within Christian nationalism and um, why it can be harmful. And of course, it's it's extremely obvious Um, as to why that might impact how we are feeling during this time for those of us who have come out of these high control religions, um, where we can hear policies like this, we can hear what political figures are saying, and even what um, pastors and clergy and and, um, spiritual leaders are saying as it pertains to um, religion and politics really being overcoupled, in my opinion. And that can feel extremely triggering. It can feel extremely unsettling um I, you know i've heard from so many people that like i i left all of that i thought i left that behind and so now to see it creeping into politics can feel really discombobulating and can feel very scary um especially when it seems like some people don't understand the gravity of what christian nationalism is and the policies that they are going for and the power that they are trying to grab and exert over other people. So that is the hope with this episode, as well as all of the other episodes that are coming up this month in our Religious Trauma and the Elections series. We are going to continue to hear from um, authors, from podcasters, professors, therapists about different aspects of religious trauma and the elections. Uh, next week, I'm so excited to be having our guest Brad Onishi, who you may have remember, or you may remember from an episode earlier this calendar year when he was talking about uh, the impact of purity culture on individual socialized male growing up in purity culture. But he'll be here next week to be talking to us about the history of how we got here. How did religion and politics become uh, connected to one another, especially as it pertains to white Uh, Christian nationalism. So I'm excited for that. And I'm excited for the rest of the episodes that we have. As always, we are so glad that you joined us. And with that, all God's people said, Amen.